Today we have been engaged in examining the land of legacy, which seems to me is so appropriate because after 50 years there is an opportunity to consider what has been its significance and also the larger question I think of its relevance. And so what I would like to do in my remarks is focus on two questions. What did the Land O'Lakes statements, statement and its drafters not do? And what did the document and the Tim Bees in Northern Wisconsin actually achieve? So my first question, what did the Land O'Lakes statement and its drafters not do? First thing I would say is contrary to some critics, the Land O'Lakes gathering July 1967 did not mark the beginning of the movement to invite laymen and women to be members of boards of trustees of Catholic colleges and universities and to separately incorporate the founding religious community from the institution. Consideration of those changes had been underway for at least the prior year and became public on Sunday, January 22nd, 1967, when the New York Times published a front page story headline, Jesuits giving up control of St. Louis to lay And it reported the decision by the St. Louis University Board to reorganize itself to include 18 lay people and 10 Jesuits with a lay chair. And it also included the change that the Jesuit community at St. Louis U established itself as a separate corporation. Those changes reflected lots of reflection about Vatican II and ways in which universities, St. Louis, Notre Dame, and later on a number of other schools, wanted to ensure better representation of various interests Concerns. They wanted to strengthen the school's influence and ability to raise funds. And they wanted to increase engagement of lay. I would say, second, as noted in the preamble of the Land of Lake Statement, the document did not pretend to present a full philosophy or description of the Catholic University. And it acknowledged in that opening section that it intended to be selectively and deliberately incomplete. It never sought to be the final word. In addition, because the gathering was in preparation for a worldwide meeting of the Federation of Catholic Universities, it did not consider, quote, the nature and role of Catholic liberal arts colleges and smaller universities, unquote. As we heard here today, its focus was on university level problems. And if you look early in the document, it says it's a study document. Third thing that Lionel Lakes did not do was as a document, it did not always convey ideas with sufficient nuance and clarity. An example would be that phrase that's been talked about a great deal, the call for a true autonomy and academic freedom in the face of authority of whatever kind, lay or clerical, external to the academic community, unquote. That language, I think, reflected frustrations of Catholic educational leaders over interference in earlier decades by church officials, and also fears that courts might determine that Catholic colleges and universities were ineligible for government funds. Recall that in August 1966, the U.S. Supreme Court let stand a decision of the Maryland Court of Appeals that three church-related schools, two of which were Catholic, 
could not receive state construction grants because they were sectarian. Also, financial pressures in the late 1960s were growing in Catholic higher education. And certainly, a number of presidents, I think most especially of Father Paul Reiner at St. Louis U, were increasingly concerned about ensuring access to government funds for facilities and academic programs. I also think we should acknowledge that the call for autonomy that had been made, was made at Land O'Lakes, also had been made earlier. Land O'Lakes did not start the call for autonomy in Catholic higher ed. That had raised itself at the Tokyo meeting in 1965 of the International Federation of Catholic University. I also think it's important when we're thinking about the context of Land O'Lakes to acknowledge that a year later, when there was the International Federation meeting in Kinshasa, in Congo, that it said, quote, Catholic universities are dedicated by an institutional commitment, which includes a respect for and a voluntary acceptance of the church's teaching authority. So as I think about those issues, I also have certainly read in the last six months a number of critics of Land Lakes who have said that the signers of the document rejected all authority outside their institutions, favored elimination of ties with the Catholic Church, and advocated secularization of Catholic colleges and universities. I think that's simply untrue. The people who gathered at Land Lakes were leading educators who appreciated the importance of working with accrediting associations, state and federal government, and the church. And they also believe, I think very strongly, that the Catholic University not only can and must be a university in the authentic sense of the word, but that in fact, the Catholic University pro properly developed can even be more fully achieving the idea of a true university. A fourth aspect of the Land O'Lakes that I think is a negative is it did not recognize the long-term effects of Vatican II and the cultural upheaval in America concerning authority, priesthood, and religious life. Nor was there a grasp of how secularism would spread and affect the Western world. I'd also say Land O'Lakes had a simplistic confidence in the potential for theologians to influence intellectual discourse in the Catholic University, and it did not anticipate the difficulty of identifying, recruiting, and retaining faculty committed to the Catholic intellectual and religious tradition. Moreover, Land O'Lakes would have been stronger if it had articulated essential elements and mutual benefits in the relationships between Catholic institutions of higher education and the Catholic Church. Would that Land O'Lakes had described how the Catholic University could be a meeting place between faith and culture, mediating the church to modern society and modern society to the church. So that's what I would say about what Land O'Lakes did not do. My second focus, what did the document and the attendees actually achieve? Uh, first, it would be a huge mistake to conclude that Land O'Lakes did not accomplish anything or to ignore the significant contributions that it has made to the self-understanding mission and image of Catholic higher education in the United States. First, 
It provided a fresh, optimistic vision for Catholic University. One that stressed the importance of being committed to academic excellence, and called for Catholicism in that phrase we talked about today, to be perceptibly present and effectively operative in the institution. Landolais also helped change attitudes and practices of church officials in regard to personnel and policies in Catholic higher education, specifically in regard to curriculum, academic quality, and institutional autonomy. Second, the document also emphasized the value of interdisciplinary dialogue and an undergraduate education that was contemporary but also attentive to theological and philosophical questions. Also important for the encouragement and validation, it offered to those striving to help revitalize Catholic higher education and engage contemporary society, especially through liturgy of sacraments, dialogue among students and faculty, and new forms of Christian witness service. Third, I'd also say Landolais was particularly an inspiration and a valued resource in the 1980s and 1990s when Catholic educators in the United States were responding to attempts to impose limitations on theologians through the Mandatum process and to tighten controls on Catholic colleges and universities. And finally, and most of all, those who gathered at Land Lakes, Wisconsin in 1967 should be given much credit and respect for their efforts to articulate a vision for Catholic universities in their day. That goal remains admirable and worthwhile. So much needed in our day. And I want to conclude with this. We require now and going forward a powerful, compelling rationale for Catholic higher education. One that draws from the Catholic intellectual tradition, affirms the value of the humanities and all of the liberal arts, and seeks to integrate intellectual excellence and religious commitment in the service of the Catholic community and wider society. Because as Proverbs 29, 18 declares, where there is no vision, 